Uh, thank you for joining us. Tonight's uh, topic is vegetable production tips and tricks. And our speaker tonight is Courtney Cheetah. Courtney is at the University of Minnesota. And uh, Courtney will talk about several crops, everything from arugula to zucchini and most of the vegetables that we can grow in Minnesota. And she's going to discuss some of the tools and tips that they've used uh, over the last 10 seasons at the Cornucopia Student Organic Farm, and that's right on the St. Paul campus. With that, I am going to mute myself and I'm going to turn it over to Courtney. Sounds great. Thanks, Jim. Well, let's get started. I think I actually counted it up and we have about 115 crops that we're going to talk about um, into varying degrees tonight. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so I'm from the Cornucopia Student Organic Farm, and we are a organic farm at the University of Minnesota that is really focused on providing students with hands-on whole farm learning opportunities, food for our local community, and a place for community building, multidisciplinary education, research, and outreach. And um, we are a student program of the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. I have my contact information um, up there on the screen right now, and it'll be in the very last slide as well, but I just wanted to put that up there. Um, and so I've, I've worked with Jim a long time ago when he was on the MISA board, and um, I've been growing for the last 10 years with Cornucopia and trying to figure out how to grow everything that we can grow here in Minnesota. So we're going to jump in here. First thing I want to talk about is um, plants, planting, and successions. And so as you're thinking about planting your garden for this coming season or your farm, um, you might want to think about how you're going to start your plants. Are you going to use transplants or are you going to direct seed them? Um, direct seeding has some definite um, pro pros, positive pieces to it, and that it's typically less ex expensive. Um, you know, you, you have lots of different sources of seeds and really great varieties to choose from because you can choose from whatever varieties of seeds you can find. Um, the, the, the downsides of doing direct seeding would be that they're, um, you sometimes don't know if seeds are going to germinate. If you're going to get a really good stand, if it's uniform or not. Um, so you do, but those are things to consider um, if you're going to direct seed or transplant things. Um, I want to actually have a bunch of these little uh, videos that we can actually embed. I've got them in this presentation for you to, to look at. So we're going to look at a couple of those here. Um, and so the first one I want to share with you is Hi, my I'm going to share this uh, using a earthway seeder and show you what that looks like. You can see this is so simple that, you know, like a two-year-old is helping with it. But basically what it's doing is it's opening up a furrow, dropping the seeds down as it, the wheels turn, they're turning a mechanism, and then it's covering them up as well with a little chain behind it. Okay, that was good. Okay, I just want to come back and make sure that we're all, that worked. Um, I don't see anybody chatting saying, no, it didn't work, so that's good. Um, so let me show you another one that's a four-row cedar. cedar. I'm going to jump ahead here. From Johnny's, of course, and Johnny's planting seeds. We've got Anthony Stevenson here. You know, planting seeds can be difficult, but the four row pinpoint cedar takes it a breeze, and you're going to give a little demonstration today. I am. All right. Tell us a little bit about this tool. Okay, this is called a four row pinpoint seeder. And what it does is it, it 
enable you to plant four rows of varying space and pinpoint X. So we're paying what type of seed would I use? This is ideal for planting small to mid sized seeds. So things like lettuces, carrots, all those teeny tiny seeds that are hard to grab. Yeah. Hey, let me show you the features. There are four hoppers that you put the seeds into. Each hopper is two and a quarter inches apart. So you can adjust your row space depending on which hopper you want. On the bottom of each hopper, there's a dimple. You would select the dimple that matches the seed size that you're using. You slide the shaft back and forth. Once you've done that, all these brushes are adjustable, and that will limit the amount of seed is actually dropping out, uh, ideally one or two. On the back of it, on the bottom, these are plows that make furrows that you can actually drop into. And does it cover it as well? No, you, that's the only thing you have to do. So it's not supposed to work for you. Right. That's a great little tool. So we have to be one row of four, and then you do it. You need more, yeah. The best thing to actually do is to lay this wheel and the track with this wheel at the same time. Just keep going. Thanks for introducing us to the four row pinpoint. Okay, so that's the four row pinpoint here. There's also an additional um, Jang cedar that is similar to the Earthway cedar. Instead of having um, discs that are you change out to um, drop the seeds into it, it has rollers um, and a little bit different um, hopper, but it's very similar to the, the four row. It's more expensive. Then the Earthway, but the Earthway tends to, from what the experience that I've had, if you have, if you have any kind of bumpy soil or um, your soil isn't really nice and smooth with no rocks and no bumps, it can be difficult to um, get a nice clean row and, and good um, germ, good planting of seeds and in uniformity. The Jane is a little bit more forgiving in that respect. So um, it kind of just depends on what your budget is. One row cedar can be like, I think about $150. The Jane Cedar is more like $350. Um, both of those can be, you can put multiple of them together to um, plant more than one row at once, but then obviously you have to have multiple cedars. Um, sometimes it's easier to just go back and forth with one. The four row cedar is uh, more expensive. I want to say that's more in the like four to $500 range. But just to give you an idea of what is out there for direct seeding. Um, transplants, I tend to think that transplants are you can get them going earlier because you can start them inside. They're going to be faster than seeds, um, just in that you can get them started. Uh, and you have an improved spinal stand in that you know that every plant that you put out there has been planted and you're not waiting for seeds to germinate and you don't know. Um, it takes out some of that guesswork of is this going to grow or not. Um, it's going to cost more typically um, in that you're going to either have to have the materials to um, germinate them and grow the transplants inside in a greenhouse or under grow lamps, or you're going to have to buy the transplants compared to the seeds. Um, there's usually less varietal selection if you're not starting your own seeds, just based on what's available out there um, at stores or from other places you could source transplants from. Um, and you may have to protect them from an early season frost as well. There is a really cool tool that I want to show you that's called the Hatfield Transplanter that I absolutely love. It's just such a slick tool in terms of um, having, speeding up your planting process and just making it really easy. This tool is awesome. It takes two people to work. You can see one person's working the Hatfield Transplanter, um, basically pushing it down to the soil. The other person is popping the transplants into the the little hopper there, they fall down. Um, I usually typically like to have a third person coming along and just chucking the plants in after the two people have done this, but it's super fast. I mean, you can plant lots and lots of um, plants really, really fast, which is nice. It's fast and easy. And then I think the Hatfield Transplanter is less than $200. It's really, really reasonable and works really, really well for transplants. Especially if transplants that are in a nice straight row like that, quick and easy, you can usually um, go, go ahead and um, you know lay out the first row. And then once you are um, got that first row, you can kind of just eyeball the second row, third row, fourth row as you go. 
So thinking about if you are going to do um, transplant plug trays, a lot of people use plug trays. There's all different types and sizes. Um, the thing that I'm that concerns me about plug trays is a lot of times um, when you're growing things, things can get really brute bound in a plug tray. Um, the example there, the kale, these seedling that just has roots wrapped around each other. Um, if you try to put that in the ground, you're going to have to break it apart. It's going to sit there, and it's going to probably be a little bit stunted um, as you go. Um, one of the best solutions, other options, I guess, before I get to my favorite solution, um, jiffy pots, they can have an interesting um, challenge in that they're, they're the little pellets that you get wet, they expand, um, they've got a soil medium or a soilless media in there with a little net around it. What I've found is that those um, have a similar problem where those roots get all entangled in there and those nets don't break down fast enough. Um, and so you often are stuck with, you kind of have to tear the net apart and then you disturb the roots and it might not be much better than um, having them be really root bound in the, the plug trays. Um, compostable pots are another option. Um, with those, they are not going to break down super, super fast in the soil. So um, sometimes you need to either, again, break those apart and take them off um, so that roots are free to get growing. Um, if you do keep those pots in the ground, um, you want to make sure that the lip, the lip of it is covered with soil. Um, this is really important because if you don't do that, the, the moisture that's down by the roots that you want to stay by the roots to water the plant and give the plant moisture are going to actually just wick up the sides of the pot and evaporate out off the top edge if that's not buried underneath the soil. So that's something to consider with the compostable pots. Um, my favorite option is actually to use soil block. Um, soil blocks are made with a special little tool. Um, there's a picture of the tiniest one. I usually tend to use the one and three eighths inch for most things. Um, and I can give you a little quick video of what the soil block makers um, typically, what they're all about. We're going to make a soil block today, a la Elliot Coleman. So first you have a soil block maker, and you either wash it out with soft and water. Then, whoops, okay, Crystal's showing us the bottom of that. Then you carry it over to your soil mix. This soil mix is uh, compost, peat, and perlite, and it's been mixed up with a hoe in this bucket. Crystal's um, making the soil block maker go kind of side to side to get the soil blocks in there. Then she leans it over, takes a trowel, and cuts off the edges, or the bottom rather, so that it lays down evenly. Then she'll bring it over to a container here. And then up at the top, there's a release that she presses down and up. And then when you're all done, she lifts up. And there's a bunch of soil blocks, all made. So the reason that these particular soil blocks have holes in the middle is that the peppers that were planted earlier in those the smaller soil blocks will fit right into, can you hold off for that? Will fit right into that space. Thanks. That's it. So the soil block makers, um, they're, they come in a bunch of different sizes. They are really pretty easy to use and make. You, you mix up a potting mix that's specially for um, soil blocks. You can get it. There's, there's a bunch of companies that make them. Cosmo has one. Purple Cow has one. Um, or you can get the, uh, the original Elliott Coleman uh, ingredients out of the New Organic Grower to mix those up. What I really like about soil blocks is that um, because there's that little bit of air around all of the, the soil blocks, the roots tend to start, grow, the, the seeds germinate, the roots start growing, and they hit that, that wall of air, and essentially they root prune, or they air prune themselves, and you end up getting a denser root ball that is not root bound. And so as soon as you get that plant into the ground, those roots all just kind of wake up and go, oh yeah, let's keep growing, there's more soil. And um, you get end up with really healthy, happy, transplants that don't have transplant shock um, for them in my experience. So I really, really like the soil boxes. They're a really great um, investment. You can reuse the plastic trays that, that they are put in. Um, it reduces your, you know, 
how much plastic you end up using, it's just a really great option. Um, I pretty much use Soblox for everything that I'm transplanting except for tomatoes um, and maybe some of the cucurbits. The cucurbits, they're only in that pot for about 10 days um, as they're growing. And then the, the tomatoes look like a lot much taller, bigger soil block than I've been able to make hold together. Um, so you also want to think about when you're starting plants, grid or row spacing. Um, if you're going to do things in long rows, if you're going to do things in a grid, um, other options would include like a hexagonal biointensive method. Um, here you're planting basically things in triangles or octagonal or hexagonal um, shapes. Um, and basically, each plant has just enough room so at maturity it'll just barely touch and um, create like a CO2 envelope around the plant and makes it pretty healthy and happy. Um, I think it's also important to think about succession planting in terms of if you're going to plant more than one thing um, in a space during the course of the season. So potentially having something like crop of spinach come in early, then pulling that out, putting in lettuces. Um, pulling out the lettuces once they're done, putting in radishes. Um, you can do this with a lot of really short season crops. It can be pretty easy to do and it really maximizes your production. Um, the way that I like to think about it is we have about 150 days between May 15th and October 15th. I know I realize that October 15th sometimes we can get um, a frost before then and if you're up north you may have even shorter. But there are a number of crops that are really pretty fast and some of them you can even transplant to get even quicker. Um, growing season on. Um, so that's something to think about and to, to plan ahead for. Um, another tool that I really, really like is the broad fork. Um, I really think it's a great tool in terms of cultivation and prepping your beds ahead of time. Um, there are a number of different ones available. I recently got, last year, got a meadow creature one that I really like. Um, and I'm just going to show you this. This is really what the, the broad fork does is it works really well to um, aerate your soil and give, give your soil lots of um, opportunity to um, have air space in it to grow and to, to just give you know, room for, for the, the plants that they need, the roots to grow. Using the meadow creature broad fork. I put the broad fork in the ground and the tines go into the soil, and I step onto the broad fork, and it pushes it down into the soil. I use the weight of my body. I don't try to jam it down. It goes down into the soil, and I let my body rest there. Then I step off of the fork, pull it up, and step back a pace, and do it all over again. I like to place the tines into the ground to handle vertical, and then I use my weight, either stepping onto the broad fork or hopping on it, uh, again, using my weight, I like to lean back with the tool to draw the fork back, and that pops the soil up a bit for me. A broad fork is a great tool for women to use. It's not a tool that you need to throw around or um, have a whole lot of upper body strength. Don't feel like you have to jump on it <laughs> or lift it up. It's really easy to like feel like you have to muscle it around, and you don't need to feel like a tool to do work for you. Meadowcreature.com, artisan farm. Okay. So I like the broad park for just creating your soil instead of tilling it um, at the beginning of the season or in between crops as well. It just works really well for that um, purpose. It's really usable. It, I have found that um, men do tend to hop on it more than women. Women are more like, I don't know, that's maybe <laughs> a generalization, but that is definitely something I've noticed, which is kind of funny. Um, yeah. So let us get into all those different fruits and vegetables that we are going to talk about today. Um, I think it's really important to um, think about what crop families um, the, each vegetable belongs to, and so I've actually organized this presentation based on those different families. Um, and it's, it's really to help you with your rotation. Um, you know, ideally a crop rotation are two crops that are planted um, one right after the other that are different botanically. They don't take the same demands on the soil for nutrients as one another, and they don't share the same pest or disease as well. Lo and behold, like most 
plants in the same family either have um, similar nutrient demands or share a lot of the same insects and pests. So it's really easy to just you know which crops belong to which families to then use that as part of your uh, planning for your crop rotation over time. Um, our current <laughs> crop rotation plan, this is what it says on my um, my SOP for my organic certification is that we're not going to plant the same crops from the same family back to back in the same season or from year to year. It's that simple. I don't have like a big elaborate 11 or 12 year rotation anymore. I just say, okay, I'm, last year I had lettuce here. That's part of the composite family. Next year I'm going to plant something that's not in the composite family or after I pull that crop out as we go through the season. So jumping in to the alliums, this is um, the family that includes your onions, your scallions, leeks, shallots, your chives, uh, and garlic chives, and garlic. Um, onions, well, um, onions typically, if you're going to do um, start seedlings, I like to put three to five seeds per cell or per soil block. Um, and then one option would be to either transplant those out 12 inches apart and not divide them, or to divide them and put them each, you know, three to six inches apart um, in the, the row or in the bed. Um, other options that you have for onions would be to, um, instead of starting them for transplants, would be to buy onion sets. Onion sets are plants that are basically a couple months old from the previous year that have been grown just, just so that they're a little bit baby bulbs that you can then plant out. Um, the challenge that I've had with sets is that sometimes they will decide like, hey, I'm, I'm a biennial, it's my second year, let's throw up a, a flower head um, and try to put some of that energy into flowers. If that happens, um, you can actually just cut it off like you would cut off a garlic seed. You cut it off um, up there and you can actually sell it or eat it or use it however you like. Um, and then it'll put more of that energy into the bulb, producing the bulb and not the flower or the seeds. Shallots. Shallots are really similar to onions in that they either grow from seeds or sets. Um, they tend to be milder than onions. They use in a lot of French cooking. They're a much higher value crop than onions. Um, you can, you know, when at the farmer's market, if I can charge 50 cents for an onion, I can charge a dollar for a shallot. Um, they just have that sort of connotation. The seed is more expensive, so I guess it's probably worth charging more for it. Um, but they, they're just a really great crop that's been a really pretty easy one to grow that I really like. Scallions or green onions, um, these are pretty fast. I would say that you can probably get a crop of scallions in about 10 weeks. Um, typically, I plant them 10 to 12 seeds per cell and then transplant them out in that bunch of 10 to 12 seeds. And then they will, when I go to harvest them, I can just harvest them and they're already in the bunches, which is really nice. Um, they don't get real big. They're pretty easy to grow as well. Leeks. Leeks are, um, again, you want to start those nice and early. They, you want them to um, be, boy, John even talks about how he wants his leeks to be like a pencil. I can never get mine that big, um, even when I start them in the middle of February. Um, but you want them to be, you know, start them, start them early, middle of February. Same with your onions um, and your shallots. They're, they're typically easiest to transplant into rows that are, you know, one to three rows that are three inches apart, I find. And I find that they also require healing to get that long white part of the leek. So what I often do is I'll dig a trench that's maybe a shovel deep, um, or if I'm, I've am i got a tractor and I can, you know, the same trench that you dig for your potatoes, I dig for the leeks and then plant the leeks at the bottom of the trench. And then as they grow, you can kind of just fill in that trench with the, the soil that you've taken out of this trench and that will give them that long um, healing that gives them the long white part that is the desired for leeks. Garlic. Garlic is planted in October typically here in Minnesota. Um, typically you want to plant it in October, mulch it with straw after you've planted it. It's really easy to save the seed from garlic from year to year. Um, you basically just pick the biggest, best heads from your previous harvest, um, you know, save those and plant them in October. Um, typically, they want to cure for about three weeks before you have them for storage or before you sell them so that they will store well. Um, and that typically just means, you know, pulling them out of the ground, letting them sit in a, in a cool, dry space um, for about three weeks. Green garlic is the, the garlic plants that are, you know, 
smaller, coming from smaller cloves that you would harvest earlier in the season. And the garlic scapes are the tip, the flowering tip of the garlic plant. Um, the picture there of the garlic scape where you can see it's got two loops, that's about the perfect um, stage to harvest them at. If you wait much longer than that, that it starts going to start to get woody and straighten out and then it's been typically a little bit too far gone versus um, if you do it before that, then you're not getting as much bang for your buck out of your garlic scapes. So um, things to consider. Chives and garlic chives are um, they're perennial, they're herbs. Um, they're one of the very first crops of the season that you can harvest. I can usually get a harvest of the garlic or just the regular chives in April. Um, again, they're easy to save seed from as well. And what I like to do is have staggered cuttings for a continuous harvest throughout the whole season. So I might start harvesting them in April and then, you know, let them regrow, let one patch, you know, regrow um, and just kind of go down the line and harvest them as I go. And then you can have almost a continuous harvest of those without too many gaps throughout the season. Alliums, things to know about them. Um, they needed to be started early. They're fairly cold tolerant. Um, a lot of them, if you forget to harvest them in the fall, they will still be there in the spring, which is really nice. Um, the, the chives and garlic are considered kind of perennial. Um, they're pretty light feeders. They can be mulched with straw. They are not real weed competitive. Um, and I've found that onions and chalots can go really well in a polypropylene weed block landscaping fabric. Um, so this is a picture where I just have the, the holes about six inches apart. Um, that I've either burned or cut, and then I plant the individual seedlings into there, and it just works really great. Um, the, the fabric that I have now is probably going to be about five years old, and I think it's going to go another five, if not 15 more years, um, and just works really great to, to sort of minimize the weeding um, that's required for each bulb. Um, this is <laughs> this shows you what it looks like. This is like a Planted them in the, the polypropylene masking surface. They look beautiful. I got clover pathways in between all my beds. Um, and then the same year I decided, oh, I have this other spot. I ran under the fabric. I'll just put them out there. You can kind of see some onions in the weeds, but man, it's just so much more work. It's so much harder um, to get a good harvest if you don't control the weeds. And using that fabric works really well. Uh, it's about nine ten cents a square foot. You want to make sure that you're getting the fabric that is um, heavy duty greenhouse fabrics, not the stuff you can get at Menards in the spring that's like paper thin and just breaks down within one season. Um, you want the woven heavy duty stuff. Um, I just want to check in. <laughs> We've gone through one family, um, on to the humble family, but before that, if, um, am I talking too fast? I get excited and I talk fast, so hopefully I'm not talking too fast. Everybody's still with us. Nobody's typing in the chat box, but I think you're probably doing good. Okay, feel free to, to stop if uh, I'm going too fast or just slow me down. So the umbo family is your, uh, there's, there's herbs and there's carrot crops or vegetable crops in this family. So a lot of the root crops, carrots, celery, parsnips, fennel, um, celery rock is another one that's in this family. Um, anise, caraway, chervil, cilantro, coriander, dill, and parsley are all in the umbo family. And these are typically crops that are direct seeded, they're light feeders, and typically the mulch, the root crops are not mulched. You could um, easily mulch the herbs. Um, I find that if you mulch the root crops, the mulch just gets in the way of harvesting them. Um, so starting with the carrots, um, they are easiest to direct seed. And <laughs> thanks for the notes there, guys. Um, they're easiest to direct seed. They, they are really a great companion to radishes um, in that if you plant the radishes and the, the carrot seeds at the same time, the radishes will kind of mark your rows, which is kind of nice. Um, there you can see I have a picture of a board that I constructed a while back where I have like <laughs> each hole is about three inches apart and the idea is you drop a radish seed and a carrot seed in the hole and then um, you pick that up and then just put a light layer of soil on top and then you have really nice spacing. You do sometimes have to thin the carrots if you don't um, meticulously plant them. That's, that's a pretty labor intensive way to plant carrots but um, I'm a little space obsessed sometimes so uh, we've tried that more than once and got pretty good results with it as well.
Parsnips, um, parsnips is really, really important. They're, they're basically a lot like carrots in that you're planting them, they're growing, they grow for a pretty long time. Um, I, I tend to find that parsnips are nice to plant kind of after the peas are done in June. Um, if you plant them in middle of June, um, they tend to have just enough time to get big, but not so huge that they're too big. Um, it's really important when you're planting, um, when you're going to harvest and weed around parsnips that you wear gloves. Um, they, they have a oil in their leaves that you don't want to get on your skin. It can actually um, blister and cause a lot of bad reactions. So wearing gloves is really important. That's why you never see parsnips with their tops on at the market, um, if you've wondered about that. Uh, celery, celery root, celerac. Um, these are ones that I've heard need really sandy soil, so if you're up on the same thing, they may grow really well for you. Um, but I've also had some experience growing them and I don't have real sandy soil, and it works fairly well. Um, they do need lots of water. That would be the one thing that I've noticed about them in order to get a really good stand um, and a really good harvest local crop. They need really, really regular, um, almost constant watering. So. Um, consider that. Fennel. Fennel is another one that's in this family. Um, I think it's really pretty easy to grow. Um, I, I would recommend looking for the Florence or the bulb types. Um, there's a bronze um, common type that, or and common types that don't give you that nice big bulb. They just produce lots of leafy matter, which is fine if that's all you want, but a lot of times um, people want the bulbs. Um, it can be direct seeded or transplanted. Um, and that picture there is the swallowtail caterpillar, um, which you'll often find on members of this family. And honestly, I've never seen them do devastating amounts of damage or anything. So a lot of times I just let them. I figure I love swallowtail butterflies. If it's an all-you-can-eat swallowtail butterfly buffet, that's just fine with me. Um, yeah. Other herbs that are in this family, parsley, cilantro, and dill. Um, I find that, that parsley, all of them tend to transplant really well, um, but the dill and the cilantro are really quick to bolt. They're really quick to, to throw up a shooting stock. And once, it, once they bolt, they just don't taste quite the same. Um, the coriander, the cilantro actually turns into coriander. The coriander is what you call the, the seeds of the cilantro. So that's kind of a fun crop um, to grow in that it's dual purpose. Um, multiple plantings are definitely needed of um, cilantro and dill, you could probably plant them about once every few weeks to really get uh, a good harvest, continual harvest throughout the whole season of those. Um, chervil, caraway, and anise are also in this family. I haven't had too much uh, experience growing those, but they are also in the same family. So, uh, composite family crops. These are your lettuces, endive, radicchio, chicory, artichokes. Um, and then lots of flowers, bachelor buttons, calendula, chamomile, cosmos, sunflowers, marigolds, and zinnias, and a ton, ton more flowers. Anything that has that kind of daisy-like flower is going to be in this family. Um, so you've got vegetable crops, you've got flowers. For the most part, these are moderate feeders. They're not going to be real heavy feeders. Um, typically, you don't want to mulch any of the greens just because it makes the harvest way more difficult. And the flowers can be mulched really easily. Oops. Let's go back here. Lettuce. Lettuce can be direct seeded or transplanted. Um, there's a whole lot of diversity in lettuce. Um, they tend to be pretty quick growing crops. And um, I find that if you're going to pre-bag them for like a farmer's market, that using clear bags works a lot better than using um, some of the more translucent bags. Um, <laughs> I have these like really great biodebatable bags that had this like kind of green tinge to them and I'd put my lettuce in them and it just wouldn't sell. People like want to be able to see the lettuce for some reason. It's kind of silly, but that's the way it is. Harvesting greens. Um, you have a couple different options in terms of using different knives and different harvesters. I'm going to jump over to, our, uh, to YouTube because I think there's some good options out there. Let's see, we'll go with with the knives first. We'll start low tech and we'll get more and more progressively fancy here as we go.
really good for reaching in long. You don't have to bend over. It's a really great for harvesting in the field. The 12 inch harvest machete is great for cutting crops like grass. The 10 inch works great as well. The of our harvest machetes can also be used to trim things in the field like this broccoli block. These are our field and produce knives. The broccoli floret knife removes the step by allowing you to make florets directly in the field. These are our serrated green harvesters. We use to cut parsley. Right now I'm going to use to cut carrots. If you hold the carrot like this, come along. These are our shears. They're lamb shear style. They're really great for topping root vegetables. These are grape and tomato cluster tools. Dave, when you want to plant your potatoes, use the potato seed knife. Cut it off and plant that. So just plant the eye. Yep. You get new potatoes. Right. And we also offer sheets for some of these in leather and nylon. So some great tools. Snip away. Get any of these in the Johnny's catalog. I'm actually a really big fan of that serrated knife. Um, it makes harvesting a lot of greens really, really fast and a lot of herbs really fast. Like you can just kind of grab them, you know, swing it past and cut. Um, it's been a really great tool to try. If you haven't tried this, the serrated one, I would definitely try that one. Um, let's go to another one here. This is uh, looking at harvesting salad greens. We'll harvest some of this lettuce here. We've got the file guard. We are. We're going to use a, a greens harvester. Very nice, simple little tool. Just move it back and forth and cut all the greens and put it right in your, in your bucket. So this saves bending over, having to pick each leaf. Right. So this is this is a harvest to absolutely everything on one quick, easy motion. And is it good for head lettuce and leaf lettuce? It's better for leaf lettuce. If, if the, the head will just kind of roll around and the leaf will will pile up in the basket, like if you had mescaline mix or something like that, or salad greens, um, any kind of you know, Asian greens you do with a baby leaves. Yeah, terrific, terrific. All right, well, show me how it works. Okay, so Howard, tell me, what is this? This is pretty sharp. This is pretty sharp. This is a butcher's bandsaw plate that's been cut to fit on this tool. After you've cut a lot, I imagine you've got to sharpen it. We do, and we have a diamond hose file to use to sharpen this blade to keep sharp. It makes it like a nice hacksaw. Right. This is pretty cool. And, you know, I've always told folks who watch Growing Wisdom, you know, one of the things you want to do is keep things clean and sharp. You don't want to put this away dirty and always clean it off. Always clean it off. This is a little bigger than one we've seen already. These come in a couple sizes. They come in three different sizes, depending on how wide you are bench up. What's neat is that one person can do these two rows like that so quickly. Makes a nice clean cut. So Howard, thanks for showing us this, and this is on your website, right? It is okay. So that's one option. Um, what I found with that harvester, trying it over the years, is you have to have a really thick stand of leaf lettuce, um, and you need to have it be pretty much weed free. You don't want to have a lot of weeds in there because they're just going to get cut <laughs> as you're uh, cutting your lettuces. This is the quick cut green harvester if you want to get really high tech. Um, and this thing is basically a similar model, except it's got a cordless drill that is um, running the little toggle bar of, um, I don't even, little, little fabric um, things that are turning it around. And so as you cut it, the, the blade is reciprocating and it's pushing all the greens into the basket. Um, that again is, is another option if you're going to weigh up your production. I've heard you can harvest like 100 pounds an hour with that tool. Um, pretty cool. Fun toys to, I don't have one of those, but I've seen one um, and thought it was pretty cool and worth sharing with you. Interestingly, um, Johnny makes all those interesting um, tools, but they also have um, a new salad mix that they're selling the seed for. That's the Salanova salad mix. Um, there's basically two different mixes. There's the foundation mix and the premium mix. 
And what I found with this is you can grow all eight of them or even four of them or two of them. And then you, you what's cool about these is they're a multi-leaf um, head so that when you, you harvest the whole head as a whole, put it through your washing processing and then at the last step you can take and um, use the little tool that you can see the picture of there to sort of break apart the core of the head and then it turns into this beautiful leaf lettuce that has a ton of heft and um, weight to it that's really nice. <laughs> I wish uh, Johnny sponsored my work at NISA, but I just tend to find them to be um, a really good source for a lot of good information. So hence you, <laughs> you find that I'm, I give a lot of recommendations of their stuff it's because they have the best tools. Um, so Sionova works really great. I, it, I found it just has a really great, makes a really great leaf lettuce. It's got heft, it's got weight, weight to it. Um, it's good. I didn't have to grow it in the shade in the middle of summer. I just grew it out in the sun um, and it still tasted great. It never got bitter. It never bolted on me. Anyway, I love Salanova, so check that out if you're interested. Um, if you are interested in buying seed for it, it might be worth going in with a friend because if you buy less than a thousand seeds, it gets to be pretty spendy. Um, processing greens, um, I think that um, what I like to do with my greens is harvest them, wash them, and then after I've washed them, um, put them in mesh bags. And I actually have a, a washing machine that's just plugged in. It's not hooked up to water, but then I um, put the mesh bags in the washing machine and spin them around um, on a spin cycle for one setting. And then I find that that has just about the perfect um, moisture content to have them keep really well in plastic bags. Um, at market and in the refrigerator at home and all of that. Also in the composite family is um, endive, radicchio, and chicory. Um, these are more specialty greens. Um, in order to get that like white endive, um, you actually need to grow it in the dark, um, which is kind of interesting. You can do various different things to that. I think the, the Belgian endive that we see um, that's truly from Belgium, they like Start the seeds, cut them, start the, the plants, get it growing, and then like cut off the top and go put it in the dark for like six months and then pull it out and harvest it. So it's kind of crazy. Um, the frise and the curly types can be quick to rot and bolt. They can be a little bit more challenging um, to grow than some of the other ones, but it's another one that's in this family that is worth considering. Dandelion, too, that's another one that um, you can often, <laughs> it's a composite family crop that's worth out there harvesting, too. Um, artichokes, you can grow artichokes in Minnesota. Um, you need a lot of room. It's about a four by four foot plant um, minimum that they need. And they really need to have a, a cool period after they've germinated and started to grow to trick them into thinking that it, they've survived a winter and, um, and that they want to be a biennial and produce a flower bud um, for you. So the trick to do that would be to, you know, before it gets before we've even um, had that last frost, put them out, put the plants outside unprotected for um, a couple of nights just to make sure that they get enough of that cold treatment to um, grow. I'm going to take one quick break and shut this door so that it doesn't uh, get really loud. Hang on. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and then, it's interesting in a lot of the seed catalogs it'll say northern climates with artichokes that they're only going to produce, you know, maybe one big flower bud and then maybe three to four other ones. I've had them produce 10, 12 um, in the course of the season. So uh, they can be more productive than you'd think here in our northern climates if the, if the weather decides to cooperate. Edible flowers. I really like growing edible flowers. They, you can put them in your salad mixes. You can sell them individually. Um, if you have a market form, it makes sense to grow them. They're so easy and they're fun. Uh, bachelor buttons, calendula, chamomile, and marigolds are the main ones from this family that I like to grow. Um, I also find that there are some good plants that are also um, cosmos, sunflowers, and yes, those are, they're really good beneficial insect habitat as well as being good um, cut flowers. So they can sort of be dual purpose. The um, edible flowers as well can be good for um, attracting the good insects that you want to have in your garden. 
Moving on to the brassica family, um, this is your broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kohlrabi, radish, rutabaga, turnips, arugula, collards, kale, mustard, and Asian greens, um, and pseudolism is also in this family. These typically tend to be um, your vegetables, roots, greens, um, so they're sort of divided into those categories. Um, they're typically cool season crops. They're moderate to light feeders. Um, if you transplant them, you're typically going to mulch them, and they can be planted in succession as well. They do tend to be susceptible to flea beetles, which can overwinter in your soil, so you definitely don't want to plant um, these family plant, family plant members back to back. Um, and then cabbage loopers and all the um, different caterpillars that, um, the, you know, there's the diamondback moth and the, um, there's a bunch of them, there's like four or five of them, I think. And they're kind of tend to be all susceptible to the, in the brassica family. Cauliflower, broccoli, and romanesco, um, these are usually transplanted and you really don't want to let those transplants get root bound. Um, cauliflower seems to be the most difficult one of these. It, it, I feel like if you look at it wrong, it'll just sit there all summer and not produce anything until it cools off in the um, fall. So <laughs> that's something to think about. Let it, you know, if you don't get an early spring crop of it, let it just sit there if you have the space. And sometimes at the very, very end of the season, it'll start to make a head um, and produce something for you. Um, cauliflower, or the broccoli, the, the Romanesco tends to be more similar to the cauliflower. It's going to produce one head. The broccoli, however, if you um, let it produce one head, it'll oftentimes you can harvest multiple side shoots off of it, um, which is, are really nice, and you can harvest those all season long. Um, look at the varieties. If you're going to do side shoots, some varieties are better for side shoots than others, um, and so you can kind of plan accordingly that way. Uh, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, these are all really easy to grow. Cabbages tend to be very cold tolerant. They all really are pretty cold tolerant. Um, Brussels sprouts, are, they take a long time, um, but they're really best after the frost. The, the kohlrabi is a pretty quick one to grow. I like that one for taking to the farmer's market. Um, Brussels sprouts, the trick to know about them <laughs> is that um, right about Labor Day, you want to go out there and cut off that top um, big tip, the tip that's kind of, um, uh, that's growing on top of the, the, the very end of the stalk. Um, of the plant. You cut that off and you can actually, you know, use that. It's like a big baby cabbage. Um, I think they actually call it like a brussellini or something silly like that, um, if you want to market it that way. But then what happens is all the little brussels along the, um, the brussels sprouts along the, the stem will actually ripen much more evenly and get much bigger than if you don't cut off that tip. Um, so their side by side is um, what it looks like several weeks later, one that didn't get cut and one that did. Kale and collards, these are super easy. You plant them, um, you can transplant them or you can direct seed them, um, and basically you can harvest them all summer long. Uh, just, you know, basically breaking off the, the bottom leaves and letting the, the smaller leaves constantly getting bigger. Um, baby kale does need to get replanted to keep it small, but um, I've even heard of some dwarf baby varieties of kale that stay small, so that's something to check out. I'm going to definitely explore that this summer. Arugula, mustard greens, and Asian greens. Um, these, again, they're easy to direct seed or transplant. They're easy to grow. Um, you want to be aware of, you know, which varieties you're growing to match your, the needs, your needs or your, the needs of your market. Um, and I do find that these tend to be more susceptible to flea beetles than some of the other varieties. I cannot grow uh, arugula without putting a row cover on top of it um, to protect it from the flea beetles. They just really love arugula. Um, and so I use an agribond or a to um, cover up the plants. Um, it, it just keeps the bugs out and um, gives me a better saleable crop than I don't do that. Radishes, rutabagas, and turnips. Um, these are usually directly seeded. Um, I have transplanted the rutabagas and the turnips successfully, so that can be done. Um, radishes typically will split with uneven moisture as they approach a harvestable size. Um, the rutabagas um, are also just really, really, they get really nice and big and are easy to grow. 
Um, turnips, for some reason, I've had trouble marketing turnips. People want them in like October when my market's pretty much done. I've had really good luck with salad turnips. There's a bunch of different varieties of salad turnips that are out there. They're basically grown to a little bit bigger than a ping pong ball size. Um, and they can be eaten raw. The, the outside has a little bit of a um, spicy radish flavor to it, but if you peel that off, then it just has a nice mild cabbage flavor. Um, and so that's something to consider as you're planning for next year. Um, and there's also like red ones, white ones, yellow ones, all different colors, which are nice. The goosefoot family, moving on to this family. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I like rainbow versions of everything. So we got rainbow beets and rainbow chard. We had rainbow carrots earlier. Um, I just like the different options with colors, and they just make it so much more fun to grow. Um, so we'll be talking about beets, chard, and spinach here. Um, these can all be direct seeded or transplanted, including the beets, believe it or not. Um, they can be planted in successions. They're, they're pretty cold tolerant, and they're sort of moderate to light feeders. Um, spinach and chard. Here you can see to transplant them. The spinach does tend to bolt in the heat. Um, and, you know, I think the rainbow varieties are just so much prettier than just the plain red ones or just white or yellow. Um, and it's kind of like kale and collards where you basically can plant it and harvest it from the whole season um, as you go. With the spinach, I like to um, plant that almost when I'm planting my garlic in October plant a bed of it and then just let it be dormant over the winter and then as soon as the, the snow is thawed and melted and the soil starts to warm up, that's usually when the, those seeds will sprout and start to grow and then you get your sort of first possible harvest of spinach. It's usually really nice. Beets, beets can be um, direct seeded or transplanted, easy to grow. I like to grow all the different colors just because they look so pretty and nice together. Uh, cucurbit family. So here we're talking about melons, cucumbers, and squashes. Um, oops, that jumped fast. Or too quick. Um, these are all things that really have a vining habit. Um, don't try to plant them in a three-foot bed or a four-foot bed. They really need wide beds. They like they like to sprawl a lot. Um, we're talking like six to eight feet uh, per between rows here. Um, they're warm season crops. You want to wait until after June 1st or maybe even later if you're up north to plant them. Um, they grow really well in the polypropylene landscaping fabric that the onions grew on. Um, they tend to be heavy feeders. They're, they are susceptible to powdery mildew, and typically it just kind of happens usually uh, end of August, beginning of September, the powdery mildew just kind of comes in. And usually by then, the, the crops are, um, you know, they're established enough that it doesn't really make that much of a difference, so that's a good thing. They are susceptible to the squash bugs, squash floors, and cucumber beetles. I'm picking up some noise. If people could make sure they're muted, that would be helpful. Um, cucumbers. <laughs> spines are without spines. Um, the spines are those little prickly things that you that, that are on the cucumbers. So if you don't want those, you want to go spineless cucumbers. Um, they can be trellised, and they're typically planted in, they can be planted in succession to, um, especially in more the southern regions. And the northern regions, I don't know that it really makes that much sense to plant them in successions. Our growing season just isn't that um, long, although some big growers do tend to plant them in successions. Melons, these can be um, easy to grow. They can be trellised if they're a smaller variety. Um, I think that the hardest part with melons is knowing really when to harvest them. Um, musk melons, typically the color that's under the nuts is going to turn yellow and they kind of will slip or fall from the, off the vine as you kind of tug on them. Um, it's super helpful if you're looking at seed packets of melons. You want the varieties that slip. It just makes it so much easier to know when they're, they're ready to harvest. Um, the honeydews tend to get, um, their, their skin will change from uh, hairy to waxy when they're ripe, and you really want to smell the blossom end. That's another good indicator of, of ripeness. The watermelons, you can thump it. Um, the surface color will be a little bit dull with the contrasting color of the stripes popping. Um, and the underside where it's been resting on the ground will often get yellow. Um, and I think it's important to think about size of these melons, too. If you're just growing them for yourself, or if you're going to for a market, like really huge watermelons can be difficult to sell. I've had really good luck with smaller varieties that are good for, you know, one or two people. 
uh, over the course of a couple of days to eat. Splashes, we've got winter splash, summer splash, zucchini, and pumpkins. Um, there are a ton of different um, sizes and varieties that are out there to think about. Um, they can be direct seeded or transplanted. If you're going to transplant them, you really don't want to touch their roots. Um, they're, the roots of any of the cucurbit family just are really susceptible to shock. And um, I had a poor student once who planted like a rose of cucumbers and then decided that for his research project, he needed them moved over a foot and went back to transplant them or move them like a couple days later. And they pretty much all died because they were like, you touched our roots twice and that's too much. Um, so don't touch the roots of the cucurbit family. Um, Summer splash and zucchini, those need to be harvested like two to five times a week, depending on what size you're going for. It can get really big really fast overnight um, when you're not looking. Um, the thick skin varieties of squash and pumpkin can be cured for storage, and typically they, they're, you're going to cure them in a similar fashion to um, how you're going to cure the garlic. You're basically just going to harvest them, let them sit in a cool, dry spot for a couple weeks, and then that, then that skin will thicken up and uh, they'll store better over the winter time. Um, if you do find yourself with too much of zucchini, summer squash, um, or the winter squashes, you can always harvest the, the flowers. They are edible. Um, and there are male and female flowers on most of these. So you can, um, the, the male ones will have a long stalk on it, and the female ones won't. So that's, that's how you tell the difference between those two. Um, and this, again, works well in the polypropylene landscaping fabric. The legume family. Um, these are your bean crops, your soybeans, edamame, peanuts, peas, um, and then there's a bunch of cover crops that fall into this family too, the alfalfa, clover, vetch, and field peas. So these are usually direct seeded. They can be planted in succession. Uh, they can be heavy givers in terms of if you inoculate them, um, they can actually fix nitrogen and add that to the soil, which is great, and they can be mulched as well. Um, although typically they're not usually mulched. Peas can tend to be cool season, um, super easy to direct seed these. Um, I really like to grow field peas for pea shoots, so they're really quick, you know, uh, two-week turnaround crop. Have the, pea, the field pea seeds soaking overnight, plant them. Um, in about 10 days to two weeks, you've got a plant that's four to six inches tall, and you can just cut it off at the base and uh, use it as almost like a microgreen crop. Um, and works really well for that. It's kind of a tasty, tastes like peas, but has a leafy green texture. Um, that's pretty delicious for early spring. And again, you can inoculate them to fix nitrogen. Um, beans, there's so much diversity in beans. You've got green beans, wax beans, dry beans, purple beans, um, lots and lots of different options. Um, they're typically warm season, so you want to wait until after June 1st to plant those. And again, you can inoculate those to make them be heavy givers instead of feeders. Um, edamame and soybeans, uh, they are warm season. Again, you want to wait till after June 1st to plant them. Um, if you're going to grow them for the edamame, you typically want to look for the hairless varieties. They just are a little bit easier to eat um, as you're pulling the seeds out of the skins. Um, but they're good. Cover crops. Alfalfa, clover, vetch, field peas, these are all options. I really like to grow um, clover as my pathway between my beds. It just works really well. Um, to, uh, you can mow it any time the weeds get taller than it, and it just works, works just so slick to have that as a sort of cover crop that, that are, you could walk on even when it's wet, and uh, it's good for pollinators. I love clover. <laughs> Uh, nightshade family, this is one of my favorite families. So here we're going to talk about eggplants, ground cherries, peppers, tomatillos, tomatoes, and potatoes. These are all um, heavy feeders, so they need, um, you know, they, they work really well actually to go after the legume family um, in that they, you know, would like benefit from that nitrogen. Um, they can be mulched. Um, they are susceptible to Colorado potato beetles. That's uh, something to keep in mind. Um, they typically go after your potatoes and your eggplant first, and then they'll um, go after, I've seen them go after tomatillos and tomatoes after that, and then maybe peppers even after that if they are still there. 
um, that picture of that gross bucket is a bucket full of <laughs> drowned Colorado potato beetles. Um, so eggplants, typically you want to um, definitely transplant these guys. They just need that um, extra boost at the beginning of the season. Um, I think it's really important to think about uh, which varieties are going to meet your needs or for your market. Um, there's lots of cool, interesting ones like long, skinny green ones and Turkish ones that look like little pumpkins and uh, white ones and speckled ones. Um, typically, I find that people really like the just the big black, purple um, varieties that are, um, you know, your basic eggplant. So think about that. Um, I, mean, I see there's a bunch of questions about inoculating beans. So let's go back to that here. Um, <laughs> Since I jumped ahead too quick. So a lot of the, the, the inoculating, what it's a, a project called Garden Inoculant oftentimes, and you can buy it specifically for peas or specifically for beans or egg, um, or the edamame. And typically they, um, it's a black powder. The Garden Inoculant usually is good for all three. So keep you know, an eye on which variety of inoculant you're getting and what crops it's best for. But it's a black powder that you mix with water till it's like the consistency of a runny yogurt. And so then um, it, then what you do is you basically you can soak your seeds in it um, overnight or even just dredge them through it right before you plant them. Um, and what it does is it just makes sure that that inoculant is present in your soil. Um, the inoculant is basically a, a rhizobacterium that's in the soil. Um, sometimes naturally occurring, it helps to add this inoculant because then you know it's there for your plants. Um, and what happens is the, the when this rhizobacterium is present, it'll actually form this symbiotic relationship with the roots of the plants from the legume family. And so then they will um, basically fix nitrogen. They'll pull nitrogen out of the air um, down at the root level. So then here's another you know example of why using that broad fork is really good because that's going to add air into your pore spaces in the soil. Um, it's not pulling nitrogen out of the air from the leaves, it's actually down in the soil, um, the air spaces down there. But basically it'll uh, pull in nitrogen and then use it up in the leaves, in the fruit, in the roots, um, and it'll actually use, if you, depending on what time you harvest it, if you harvest the peas, you're going to leave a little bit of that nitrogen um, in the soil. If you don't let, if you, let's say you were to like cut off a cover crop when it's at the stage of um, just about to flower or flowering, and you can um, mix, incorporate that back into the soil, the roots and the leaves, and that's going to add more and more nitrogen to your soil as that breaks down. So hopefully that helps answer the questions about inoculation and what that means and what's involved in that, because it is pretty cool. Okay, we'll keep going here. Ground cherries. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with ground cherries, but I love ground cherries. They are just one of the funnest crops you can grow. Um, typically, you transplant them, um, but they will self-seed from year to year um, if you allow them to drop. And typically, <laughs> you think you've gotten them all, but there's still some that'll come back um, the next year, which kind of makes it fun. They basically grow in a little husk-like um, like a tomatillo, but they're much tinier, uh, and they're just super delicious. They have kind of this citrusy, I don't know, they're almost hard to describe, but they're a little bit tomato-y, but not quite, a little bit nutty. I don't know, they, have, they kind of have a texture of like a fig because they have lots of little seeds inside. Um, they're super tasty. So if you haven't grown them, you should grow them. Um, if you can find a variety that's like a giant ground cherry, they, they actually make a bigger fruit, not as many of them, but it tastes like passion fruit. They're just, they're to die for. Um, and they're pretty easy. They, they're kind of fun in that has they, they have the sort of size of a pepper plant, um, but they have these little husked fruits that actually will drop off the plant when they are ready to harvest. So you kind of get to forage around and scavenge for them, uh, which makes it kind of fun. Peppers, sweet peppers and hot peppers. Um, again, beware of, of which varieties are going to meet the needs um, of your market or your, for yourself if you're growing them for yourself. Um, some people like the really, really hot ones. Some people like the mild ones. Um, I find at our markets I can grow cayennes, I can grow jalapenos, I can grow habaneros. 
but beyond that, people are just like, oh, and poblanos, I guess, um, for the hot ones, but beyond that, people are like, meh, I don't know. They're just not as adventurous about the hot peppers, I guess. Um, the uh, the colored variety of the peppers for the sweet ones and the, and the hot ones, um, they take longer to ripen. They'll start out green and typically go to whatever color they're going to be. And these, again, you definitely don't want to transplant them. They just take long enough that they're a challenge. Tomatillos, um, similar to the other um, plants in this family, they will self-seed if you allow them to drop. In fact, they're almost hard to get rid of uh, <laughs> um, from year to year. I actually have a, a dedicated bed that's just my tomatillo bed that's in with my perennials, and I just let them self-seed from year to year because um, I know that they're going to, and it's almost easier to just let them do that. Um, and then I don't have to plant them or worry about trying to, you know, grow new ones. I just let them come back from the seeds from the previous year. Tomatoes. I love tomatoes. Um, I grew 80 varieties of tomatoes last year because I love every size, shape, color I can find. Um, most of them you're going to want to transplant. They will receive from the last year, but they're not as likely to produce very much, typically, that I've found. There's a few, you know, summer of 2012 when it was super hot, yeah, if they receded, they probably did produce quite a bit, but most years they don't get big enough to produce much um, by the end of the season, so you're better off pulling up the ones that recede and transplanting new ones. Um, plus, you don't really know what those new ones, those old ones are going to give you because they could be anything. Um, a lot of them need trellising, especially the the indeterminate types. Uh, the determinate types typically are going to be about three feet tall. They're still going to want to be trellised. Um, but the indeterminate types can get basically eight to ten feet tall um, or even taller if, if the season allows for it. Um, there's every size, shape, color. Um, the picture that I have here is kind of a picture of a Florida weave um, where you've got metal poles and bamboo poles in between them and you're um, using a, a twine to go around in between each um, hole. And so that's one way to do it. There's lots of different ways to trellis. Um, typically, I've been doing a bamboo pole next to each plant and then using tomato clips um, to, you know, connect the plant to the bamboo support and then running, tre running um, trellising twine um, in between about every fourth plant. So I have a metal stick that that goes around. Um, this last year, I tried using rebar mesh and just basically, as the plant grew, um, sort of weaving it in and out of the rebar mesh, and that worked really well. It was a lot less work than other options. So as I going forward, I will probably do more and more rebar mesh um, trellising as opposed to um, more bamboo stakes because it just works a lot better and is a lot easier. Potatoes. Um, Typically, you want to plant seed potatoes. <laughs> um, you can, you know, get the ones out of the grocery store and just cut them up and have an eye per per chunk, um, and that can work. But sometimes the potatoes in the grocery store are treated to not sprout, um, so you maybe want to make sure that they have sprouted before you uh, test them if you're going to before they, you know, plant them out there. Um, a lot of times they like to be hilled, and they'll produce more if they're hilled. And that's basically by the variety. Like uh, Yukon Gold doesn't care if it's hilled, but a lot of the smaller fingerling types really like to be hilled. So that's where you dig a trench, plant the, the potatoes at the bottom of the trench, and then pretty much, you know, by the time they're four inches tall, bury them two inches. And then when they get to be six inches tall, bury them another three inches. And you basically just keep burying them, um, and they will produce more potatoes by doing that. Um, they, they can be really easy to save seed from your deer. You can just kind of throw them. Uh, in the back of your cooler, they will sprout over the winter. You can knock off those sprouts like three times before um, it's going to be detrimental to the next plant, the, the next, if you, when you get to plant them. So keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, potatoes can be pretty easy and fun. The mint family, um, this is most of the herbs belong to the mint family. So anisips, hyssop, basil, cat mint. Uh, hyssop, lemon balm, marjoram, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, summer savory, tarragon, and thyme all belong to this family. And they're both annuals and perennials in this family. Um, the cat mint, that's for cats, <laughs> not usually humans alive. I do believe you can make a, a tea out of cat mint. Um, but you'd be surprised at how many people love to like buy cat mint for their cats at the farmer's market. So 
uh, <laughs> it's a good one to have in your market stand, and it's so easy to grow that there's really no reason not to. Um, these are really great insectary plants and they're going to host a lot of your beneficial insects. Um, they're really great companions for a lot of other crops and that they can help them grow even better. Um, they're usually transplanted. They're pretty light feeders and they can be mulched as well. Um, a few other families to think about would be, um, or crops to think about really, are the, the sweet potato, the sweet corn, and okra. Um, sweet corn or popcorn. Um, this seems to be pretty densely planted for cross-pollination. Um, they tend to be heavy feeders and they are susceptible to corn borage. Um, the sweet potato, this has a, a pretty vining habitat, so you want to plant these in pretty wide rows. Um, I think I did them five feet apart in this year, and that works pretty well. Um, they're warm, warm season, and they can be started from uh, slips. Which means, basically, you can take, um, you can either order slips, which uh, I just got my my catalog from the Sand Hill uh, Preservation Society in the mail today. Um, and they're a place in Iowa that actually grows like 100 different varieties of sweet potatoes. You should check them out if you're interested. They're super old school. You can't call them, email them. They barely have a website. Um, it's all like you write a check and send it in the mail uh, and cross your fingers that you get your sweet potatoes. Um, but the, the ones that I got from them last year were really great. Uh, you can, so you can order slips, or you can take and get a sweet potato from the store and bury it halfway in uh, like sand and keep it moist, keep that sand moist, and what it'll do is it'll actually sprout a whole bunch of little baby plants. And then you can take and break those baby plants off and root them. And then when it's time to plant them out, and usually I wait till end of May, beginning of June to plant the sweet potatoes out just because they, they really are a warm season. Um, you can plant, transplant those little baby plants out and then you'll have lots of plants. Um, I got, I think I got, I got way too many um, plants last year, sweet potatoes, because I ordered a bunch and then I wasn't sure if they were coming, so I tried starting my own and that worked way better than I thought it would. So, um, yeah, it's kind of fun to have lots of options for sweet potatoes. And there, there are different colors too. There's white ones and yellow ones and orange ones and purple ones. Um, so check that out. Okra, okra is a warm season crop. It's started from transplants. Uh, it's a heavy feeder. Um, and you want to make sure you harvest it before it gets woody. So if they get big and woody, they don't, they don't taste very good. Um, so that's something to consider. And then the last um, bit here is just thinking about other edible flowers. Um, borage, nasturtium, the violets, pansies, and violas, um, and snapdragons. These are all really good edible flowers. They're good insectary plants, they're good uh, companions to other plants, and they are light feeders as well. Um, this is a bunch of my favorite resources that I thought I would just share. Uh, the Sustainable Market Farming by Pam Dowling, that has some really great, uh, it has like a chapter for each of the crop families that I've talked about tonight, um, and goes into lots of different crops in depth. Um, the Market Gardener is my new like favorite resource Bible <laughs> that I'm, I'm reading through for like about the third time, I think. Um, it's a really, really good one that just came out about a year ago. The How to Grow More Vegetables by John Jevons, that's an old standby as along with the, the New Organic Grower by Elliot Coleman. Um, I also subscribe to the sort of spin farming, um, small plot intensive methods that are described in their books. Um, and then there's a Minnesota guide to vegetable gardening is a pretty good resource as well. And that is, I think I'm at the point where if I get a quick sip of water, we can open it up for questions. On um, how to prevent spinach and cilantro from bolting, um, that, those are both, I think, determined by heat and um, temperature. So any way that you can keep them cool or keep them shaded, I think is going to um, prevent them from bolting, especially in the heat of the summer. The cilantro just bolts really fast. Um, I think year-round, it seems like to me. Uh, so it just it really wants to get to that next uh, level of producing seeds and flowers. So planting that one every three weeks, I think, is really crucial. Um, spinach, I think, yeah, the same thing. I, I typically don't even try to do spinach in August. I just stop it, you know, mid-June and wait till. Uh, end of August usually is when you can plant it, and by then it'll be cool enough in the September and October to get some good harvesting off of it. Um, 
A favorite uh, sweet potato variety, boy, there are uh, a whole bunch of them. And I don't, I haven't grown them enough yet to um, have a, a favorite one. I, last year, I literally did the Sand Hill uh, Preservation Society. Um, <laughs> they, they basically have like a, a, you know, we'll pick, we'll do a random assortment of ones for northern, northern areas, and then I did a random assortment of colored ones, and that worked pretty well. So none of them didn't not work. So yeah. Questions. 